My Pewdie One TTL breadboard computer now has an LCD screen that can be used to display the output of programs running on the computer. This is an important milestone in adding to the general capabilities of the Pewdie One. Now it can say, Hello World. The project for today's video is pretty straightforward. It's simply to add a text display to my PD1 breadboard CPU so that programs running on my CPU can display output. However, that conceptual simplicity masks the implementation complexities I had to overcome to even make it work. Probably the primary issue that I had to overcome was caused by the fact that I'm using breadboards. Breadboards have a lot of inductance and capacitance, and inductance and capacitance will interfere with the digital signals that I'm trying to route through it. The fact that my CPU is getting quite large in terms of the number of breadboards that I'm using to host it only exasperates the problem. And so I had to come overcome some of these issues and I'll go over that in this video. Another challenge is the fact that more so than any of the projects I've done to date for the CPU, I've had to write a lot of software in order to make, even make it work. The the challenge here was the fact that I had to envision effectively a kernel for my breadboard CPU to handle some of the low-level tasks like moving data to the display or even copying memory blocks. So I'll go over some of that in this video too. Another thing I'm going to cover today is the HL register. In my last video on the stack pointer, I did mention that I implemented an HL register, but I didn't go into detail on it. The reason for that is I knew that the a the topic of the HL register was much more relevant than what I was going to cover in this video with the text display. What an HL register is, or at least the one I implemented, is a 16-bit register that reads data from the 8-bit data bus and is able to write its value to the address bus, even offsetting it with the offset register. This is pretty useful if you're trying to manipulate text or memory blocks in your program, which we are as we try to display text to the, the screen. So without much further ado, let's get into it. So let's go over the design goals of my project here. First and foremost, the goal is to attach a character display that enables the display of 64-bit numbers. Remember my overall goal of my project, why I keep on improving what was originally a Ben Eater SAP1 computer, was to evolve this to be able to do 64-bit math. Now, the largest 64-bit number in decimal requires 20 digits. So I went with one of these common 20 column by four row LCD character displays to be able to display the, the results of whatever calculations I'm going to put this computer through. The second design goal was that it, the character display should be a memory mapped I.O. device. When I made the memory mapped I.O. architecture in a couple of videos ago, it was exactly this use case that I had in mind. Basically, to be able to write to the display, I just want to be able to move a character in memory from a register to an address that represents the LCD module. Let's also talk about the goals of the HL register, since I'm going to be covering that in this video. First and foremost, the HL register, I wanted it to be a 16-bit register that can write to the address bus. So whatever values I put in there, it could be an address that sets the memory that I'm going to either read or write to. I also want to be able to read values from the data bus. That way I can interact with my programs like any other register. I want to be able to increment and decrement the value that is in the HL register much like the INJ register that I paid in one of my earlier videos. And finally, I want to be able to split the HL register into two separate 8-bit register, H and L, and then be able to use these H and L registers as general purpose 8-bit registers and whatever I need to use them for. Okay, now that we understand the design goals of this project, let's look at one of these LCD modules themselves. They are fairly simple devices. You can see they just have a screen. If you look closely, you can see the 20 characters wide by four characters in, in terms of height. Uh, it has 16 pins right here. And those pins are how you interface with it, communicate with it. So let's review the pins on the device. Here is a table with all of the pins. The first three have to deal with powering the LCD display itself. It takes a plus five volts in ground. And then this third pin is a reference voltage that is used to determine how dark the LCD character should be. This reference voltage is some value between zero and five volts. A potentiometer is usually used to divide the input plus five volts and ground, and then use the divided voltage value as a reference voltage. The fourth pin is the register select pin. The LCD module has registers much like this breadboard computer, and they are used to transfer data in and out of the LCD module. There are only two registers on this device. One is used to write and read values to and from the instruction register. 
The other is used to write and read values to and from the data memory of this device. These registers are exactly what are getting mapped to memory addresses using the memory map I.O. I implemented in the previous video. I need two addresses, one for the instructions register and one for the data register. The way I set up the memory map controller, I can use one of the memory map control lines that contains 16 addresses on it. Of course, this means most addresses on the assigned block are wasted because I only need two here. The fifth pin is the read-write pin. It tells the device if you intend to read from or write to the register selected by pin 4. Read is high and write is low. The sixth pin is an enable pin. It kind of works like a clock to signal the device when to read a value or when to write a value, but it behaves differently depending on whether you're reading or writing data to the register. If you're reading data, data will be read on the rising edge of this enable line. However, if you're writing data, it will write the data to the register on the falling edge of the enable line. This difference introduces a small complication to the design, which I will discuss later. Pins 7 through 14 are the data bus lines. These are both input and output lines, and will be either asserting or reading data from these lines depending on the read or write pin setting. Finally, pins 15 and 16 are power lines to the LCD backlight itself. The LCD backlight is powered separately from the electronics of this device, hence the need for additional power lines. The hardware design for interfacing the LCD module with the PewDie one follows these three goals. First, I need to pass signals to and from the LCD module only when the LCD memory map is active. Second, I need to manage the fact that the data lines on the LCD module are both input and output lines. Third, I need to deal with the enable pin's quirk of being either rising edge or falling edge active depending on the action being taken. For the first goal, you can see how everything is gated off the memory map control line coming in here. My first version of this module did not gate the signals like this. What I found is that this LCD module is very sensitive to its read, write, and register select lines changing in value even if the enable line does not. I would get spurious state changes in the LCD module when this was happening. So I added these gates here to control when any given signal reaches the LCD module based on whether the memory map control line is active or not. Another important element of this design is that the data lines of this LCD module are bidirectional. The thing we need to take care of is to not let the LCD module write to the data bus when the computer is not intending to interact with the LCD module. This is what the 74LS245 is used for. An important feature of the 74LS245 is that it is bidirectional. It has this pin right here, this A to B pin, that controls which direction it is reading and then writing to. So I connect the MDO line to the AB line on the 74LS245. As a reminder, this MDO line is memory device out, it is active high when I'm wanting to write from a memory device to the data bus, and it's low when I'm not wanting to do that. Correspondingly, I also have an MDI line, which is active high when I want to write from the data bus to the memory device. So I connect the MDO line to the AB pin on the 74LS245. When it's high, I'm writing from A to B or from the LCD module to the data bus, and when it's low, it's writing from B to A, or from the data bus to the LCD module. Finally, like my previous project, this project was affected by the electrical noise caused by this large breadboard's inductance and capacitance. There were a few things I needed to do to improve this breadboard CPU's tolerance of the noise. You can see some right here, where I have some capacitors on the MDO, MDI, and on this line right here. The reason I put those there is because, just empirically, found that these lines were very sensitive to power noise within the breadboard. And so by adding these capacitors, it dampens out or kind of pulls down the little spikes that would occur in the power lines and how they affected these data lines. This cleaned up the signal nicely and things were able to work much better once I added these capacitors. Another issue was the clock signal was getting very noisy despite me placing decoupling capacitors on the 555's power supply. To fix this, I actually updated the design of the clock it's a very small and subtle change, but I added Schmidt trigger inverters rather than using normal inverters 
as the Schmidt trigger inverters does a good job of cleaning up any noise that are coming out of these clock lines from the 555s. And one final issue was simply the timing of everything. Here you see the memory map line is controlling whether signals get to the LCD module or not. And one of those signals is the clock signal. Here I have the inverter clock coming in, and you'll notice that I run it through two inverters. One of the reasons why I did that is if you think back to the, the design of what my memory map controller and how it works, this memory map control line has to go through a lot of gates before it actually changes state. And so from a timing perspective, it became noticeable that this memory map control line would go high or change state a noticeable amount of time from the time when the clock went high or low. Normally, this is not a problem. The reason being is the way we set up this computer is that everything gets configured uh, on the falling edge of the clock or really the rising edge of the inverter clock. Recall that's how the step counter works and how the instruction register then is loaded and then it configures all the control lines. And then all the actions are taken on the rising edge of the clock. And so if there is a certain amount of delay between the amount of time it takes for the control lines to be configured from when the clock is uh, falling edge or the inverted clock's rising edge to when the clock actually rises again on, on the next step, that's okay. You know, as long as the, that delay is not on the order of the frequency of the clock signal, it doesn't cause problems. However, it does cause problems when this enable line that uh, we have on the LCD module is activated on the falling edge of the clock. What I found was happening is that this inverter clock would rise before the memory map device control line would go off on the next step. And so what this did was created a very small spike in this enable line going into the LCD module. If the LCD module is configured to write data into its memory, remember that occurs on a falling edge. So even though there is this little spike, when that spike came back down because the memory map control line went low and thus everything got shut off, that would create a spurious write into the LCD module. And here's what this looked like on my oscilloscope. The top yellow line is the enable line as it goes into the LCD module. The bottom pink line is the inverter clock. You can see the first time that the enable line goes high, it does so when the inverter clock goes high. And then it stays high while the inverter clock is also high. On the next clock cycle, you can see the enable line has a very small spike when the inverted clock goes high. This is because the memory map control line signal doesn't reach the LCD module logic until a few moments after the inverted clock goes high. Hence, you see this small little spike, and the fact that that spike goes up, it also must come down, and it's that second trailing edge that causes problems with the LCD module. One way to fix that is to start to delay the signal a little bit more. So that's why I have these two inverters here to delay the clock signal from reaching the LCD module. I found that that wasn't enough. And so that's what this capacitor is for. Because it was a very short spike and this capacitor would dampen that out and actually make things work correctly. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I don't know if using these capacitors the way I do is the best way to solve these problems. If you have any perspective on that, please leave a comment down below. I'd love to get some insight out to best handle these kind of problems in this breadboard computer. Nonetheless, these issues really portend to the fact that sooner or later, I really can't build more onto, on this breadboard computer. The breadboard itself is causing problems for adding features and expanding on this CPU. So eventually, I'm going to need to move this Beauty One computer to a PCB. But that's a future project. I want to sort out a few elements of the design before that actually happens. Now I want to talk about a software feature I needed to implement in order to make my LCD screen work. A goal I have is to make scrolling text on this LCD screen. However, the hardware doesn't enable it. If I want to scroll text, I have to implement that in software. This LCD module has RAM that contains the character that's being displayed on the screen. The location that the character is displayed on the screen corresponds to the RAM address at which that character resides. Now, given that, let's review how you draw to the screen on these LCD modules. The first step is to set the location of the cursor. This is the same as setting the current RAM address in the LCD module. 
But when you do this, it additionally places the cursor in the corresponding screen location. Note that in this illustration, I make the cursor visible. You can configure the LCD module to not display the cursor. If you do that, the cursor is still there, you just don't see it printed to the screen. Second, you write a character value to the RAM address that the cursor is currently pointing at. When you do this, the character now displays on the screen and the cursor value is incremented. This increment is done automatically by the LCD module and is done for convenience. If you want to stream a number of characters to the screen, you just keep on writing the characters and the memory address that you're writing to will auto increment as you do that. When you write a value to the LCD character's RAM, it's always placed where the cursor is. Since the cursor increments when you add a character value, this makes it convenient to quickly add a string of characters. Similarly, you can read the LCD module's RAM from where the cursor currently is. And when you read the character from RAM, the cursor also increments. One might think the way to handle scrolling would be to read a character on one line, then write it immediately to the position above it. Indeed, this would work, but it would be slow. The problem is that when you want to read and write RAM to the LCD module, you first need to set the RAM address. You can think of this as setting the cursor position. Now, the cursor does auto increment after you read it or write, but the auto incrementing may not place the cursor where you want it. If you move the character in one row to the row above it, one character at a time, you will need to first set the address before you read the character on the lower row, and then set it again before you write the character to the new position. Then you need to set the address again to erase the character from the original position. Now you could speed this up by reading all the characters in a row in one pass, and then write them all in the row above in the next pass, and then go back and erase all the characters in the original row in the third pass. However, we could do this faster yet. The issue of why this is slow is that we need to read characters at one location and then copy them to another. Let's consider another approach. If I buffer in RAM the text to be displayed on the LCD screen, there is a way to move the rows much more quickly than moving the values around in the LCD RAM. To buffer the contents of the LCD display, I would need 80 bytes, which is equal to the 20 columns times the four rows. There are a total of 80 RAM positions that correspond to characters on the screen. For illustrative purposes, we can arrange the 80 bytes into four rows of 20, just like the LCD display. Then the address of the start of row zero is the start address of the buffer. Row one is at the buffer address plus 20, row two at plus 40, and row three at plus 60. Now you might say that this is no different than what the LCD module does, but the thing is, a memory address on the LCD RAM is hardwired to a specific location on the screen. The same is not true for this buffer that we just created. We can add four more variables that each contain the starting address in the buffer for a particular row. I will call these row pointers. Then, all we need to do to scroll the lines in the buffer is to swap the values amongst these row pointers. That is, the row zero pointer now contains what used to be in row one, the row one pointer now contains what used to be in the row two pointer, the row two pointer now contains the row three pointer, and the row three pointer now contains row four. Then we can overwrite the contents of the new row three location with the next text we wish to write at the bottom row for the scrolling. Once the buffer and the pointers have been updated in this manner, then the content of each row can be very quickly written to the LCD screen. To improve the visual aesthetics, we can use the LCD screen's built-in clear screen command before we start writing the updated rows. This speeds up the scrolling significantly because we don't have to move the values in the whole row to another location. I'm not going to review the code that implements the scrolling technique, but if you want to review it, the code is available in my GitHub repository. The link will be down in the description. In my last video on the stack pointer, I also introduced the concept of the address offset. As a quick review, it is a way to add an offset to the value on the address bus to calculate a finalized address that will be used to access the memory devices. While the address offset enables the dynamics I wanted for the stack pointer, it also makes this HL register very useful. Before I get into some of the use cases, I want to point out the full range of options I have built into the PewDie 1 Beta 3 microcode. As you can see from this architecture diagram, the offset value is set from the data bus. This means it can be set by anything that can write its value to the data bus. In a microcode, I have enabled setting this offset using an immediate value, the A, I, and J registers, and a value from the stack given an immediate offset. That is, 
The offset value that is used to offset the HL register can be set by a stack value that has its own offset value. I certainly could have enabled more sources for the offset value, but then there is a constraint on instruction codes. Every new offset source requires its own distinct instruction value. This PD1 breadboard CPU has a total of 511 instruction values available. When you consider all the possible distinct values of data move and other operations in combination of all the various addressing modes, the combinatorics of this quickly exceeds 511 instruction values. So, this is where design comes in. I had to make choices as to which instructions and addressing mode combinations I would enable based on their utility. Here is the schematic for the HL register. It's pretty straightforward. In fact, it's very similar to the stack pointer I discussed in my last video, with the one exception is that you can reset its value from the data bus as opposed to the stack pointer where, where you couldn't. Four 74LS169 up-down counters are used for the register, allowing both the load and store of a value plus the increment and decrement of that value. The logic here uses the high-low signal to determine whether the data we're reading in from the data bus should be written into the low byte or the high byte of the register. The HLE and the sublines are used to control whether we are incrementing the value in the register or decrementing the value in the register. The output to the address bus is moderated by two 74LS245s, each controlled by the HLE signal. So let's talk about a use case for the HL register plus an offset. One thing you can do is use the HL register to convert an integer value to its hexadecimal string representation. This is a pretty simple use case, but it does show the utility of this register. So let's look at the code for the conversion. Here you see I've created a function that I called uint8 to hex c string, which converts a past uint8, or basically a one byte value, to a hex formatted c string, or a string that is null terminated. Now, I, I do know in my description of this function that it doesn't prepend the string produced with either a 0x or a dollar sign. That's something that the user of this function would need to do depending on what they're trying to accomplish. This function takes three arguments. The first argument, which is at stack pointer plus two, is the uint8 value that we're trying to convert to the string. The second is the buffer address that the string that we produce should be written to. And the third argument is a buffer index to write at. For example, I could give a buffer value that is at hex 8000, but I want this particular string to be written to hex 8004. And so this buffer index, it would be the value of four that will offset the original buffer as to where to start the string. So given that interface, this is how we implement it. The first thing to note is that I have used lookup tables here. What these lookup tables do is allow me to map any given byte value to the string character that should be displayed for that byte value at either the upper nibble or the, for the first character or the lower nibble or the second character. And so, ostensibly, what this code does is it takes the byte value that I'm trying to convert to hexadecimal string and use that byte value as an offset to first to the upper nibble lookup table and then second to the lower nibble lookup table in order to identify the exact characters that should be used for the hex string. If you look at the code, that's exactly what happens here. First, we move the, the address to the upper nibble lookup table into the HL register. Then we offset the HL register by the value we're trying to convert. Now this notation here is what I was talking about earlier in terms of how I can write the microcode to be able to use any value that I can get from the data bus as an offset to the HL register. Here I'm using a value at a particular location in the stack to be the offset to the HL register. This location on the stack ends up being the value that we are trying to convert to a hexadecimal string. So what I'm doing is I'm adding the value that I'm trying to convert to the hexadecimal string to the HL register. Then, again, this notation is like a dereferencing notation. Then I take the value at that memory address. So, and then I move that value at that memory address into the A register for using a little bit later. The second thing that needs to happen is we take the buffer address that I want to write the character into and I place it into the HL register. Then I move the character value that I just calculated by the lookup table for the upper nibble into the buffer at the offset that is indicated by the third argument to this function. 
Then we repeat it once more in order to get the character for the lower nibble or the second character in the hexadecimal string. You will note that before I write the second character into the HL register, which contains the buffer offset by the buffer offset that's passed, I actually increment the HL register by one. This allows me to find the memory address where the second character should go. After doing that, I increment the HL register one more time and I set that value to zero, which is the null terminated C string that I use by convention in managing strings here on my Pewty1 breadboard CPU. And when that's done, I simply return from the function. Now, you may say, whoa, that's 512 bytes of lookup table in order to convert a value to a hexadecimal string. Couldn't you make that more efficient? The answer to that is yes. This is a bit overkill uh, in terms of memory usage in order to do this conversion. In order to reduce the memory used for these lookup tables, I would need additional features in the ALU on my Beauty One breadboard CPU. Specifically, I would need bit masking and bit shifting in order to grab the four bits of the upper nibble and then shift them right four bits in order to create an offset to a smaller lookup table. Unfortunately, my PD1 CPU's arithmetic logic unit is not able to do that yet. Adding that ability of bit shifting and bit masking and other kind of logical bit operations will be a future project for me as I improve this PD1 CPU, and I will be making a video about that at some point in the future. So stay tuned for that. I've also written a quick demo program. And what this demo program does is exercise a few of the various functionalities that I built into the code that I wrote to support the LCD module. The first thing you will know is here at the top, I have a new macro that I've defined in Bespoke ASM that allows me to specify for any given file that I'm compiling, what is the language version that I need to compile it against. This allows me to update the instruction set architecture and then make sure my code that I'm compiling is using the right instruction set architecture. Here, what I was saying is that to compile this code, Bespoke ASM needs to ensure it is using the Pewty1 beta instruction set architecture version 0.3.0 or newer. I also include another assembly file, which I call system.asm. And this file contains all of the low-level functions that I created to enable functionality on the LCD screen, also to manipulate memory blocks and do a few other utilities. You can think of this as described by the file name as the system code for my Pewdie one computer. So what I'm gonna do in this demo is to write a few strings to the LCD, scrolling them as I write. So I talked earlier in this video how to do scrolling. Here's where I use it. The strings I'm gonna write are actually here at the bottom. First, I'm gonna write hello world. Then I'm gonna write this string that looks a little weird here. It has um, these escape characters, which is in indicating that I'm gonna write hex value one space, then hex value two space, and so on. What's going on here is I'm actually gonna install some custom characters. These custom characters are defined by these character buffers down here. What these character buffers indicate is basically the bitmap that the LCD module should be using in order to display the characters that I define with this custom character design. I have two custom characters. One is a smiley character. If you look closely between the ones and the zeros, you can kind of see the smiley design here. I also have a heart character, and both of these are what are going to be printed in this particular string when the character values of one and the character value of two is printed to the LCD module. Then finally, I'm gonna print a hex number that is converted from an actual integer value using the algorithm that I just talked about previously. The way this code works is at the start of it, at this init, I need to reset the stack pointer. I discussed this in my prior video that in order to set the stack pointer as a starting value, I have to issue this command. Then I call a function that's implemented in my system code, which is the LCD init. And this does exactly what it sounds, is initializes the LCD module. The next thing I do is install the custom characters I just described into character values one and then character value two for the heart character. Then I print the strings. It's pretty straightforward. I push onto the stack the string that I want to, the buffer, that is, of the string that I want to print. And the first one I want to print is the hello world C string, which is, again, defined right here. And then I call the LCD print line C string. 
This function takes care of scrolling the screen and then printing the string to the bottom line of the LCD module. After it's printed to the screen, I have a delay function here. You know, just for aesthetic purposes, it delays for a little bit so that you can actually read the string before it scrolls away. Then I print the second line. The second line is the one that contains the custom characters. Again, I delay for aesthetic reasons. Then the next thing I do is convert the, the value, this magic value right here, 48879, to the hex string. I do that by first copying the magic number C string, which is really a prefix to the, to the hexadecimal number that I'm going to convert, copying it to a character buffer using this C string copy function that I have implemented. Then, once it's copied to the buffer, I'm going to calculate the length of that string. The reason why I need to know the length of this string is that's the offset of which the hexadecimal string that the number gets converted into needs to be written to in the character buffer. So now that I got that offset, I now convert the value to the hex string by passing all the argument values that I previously described onto the stack and then calling the uint 16 to hex C string. Now, I just showed you the uint8 to hex string function. The uint16 to hex string function actually calls the uint8 to hex string function twice, one for each byte of a 16 bit value. Once that's done, the string buffer now contains both the prefix, which is hex number colon space dollar sign, and the hexadecimal string converted from the value that I passed. Then I just print that to the LCD screen, much like the prior lines were printed, and I pause again for aesthetic reasons. Once that's done, I jump back to the start and repeat the cycle again. So let's see that work. Now let's go ahead and run the code that I just went over. I already compiled and programmed the code onto the ROM image right here. So all I really need to do is just turn on this computer and run it. But first, let's zoom in the camera to the LCD module so that you can more clearly see what's getting printed to the screen. Okay, here we go. Here is a close up of the LCD screen. So to see it work, all I need to do is turn on the computer and then start the clock. You can see the first string is on and here's the custom characters. And now next is gonna be converting the integer value to a hex string. And so that integer value, which was 48879, gets converted to a hex string of B E E F. Beef. Classic computer science joke. Now the program is repeating through the strings as I talked about when going over the code. So looks like it's working. Great. So as you know, my goal is to build Pewdie One so that it'll be able to do 64 bit math. Some of you might say I can do that now. And that's true in some sense. In my next video, I'm going to demonstrate that while this computer can be made to do 16-bit math, and by extension 64-bit math, the Pewdie one design as it currently stands isn't quite ready to do that well. So I'll be going over the details of how to do 16-bit math on an 8-bit computer and kind of explain how a hardware design can make that more efficient or less efficient. As a reminder, all of my schematics and code are available on my GitHub repository. The link is down in the description. Thanks for watching my video today. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you liked it, please do like the video and subscribe to my channel so that you'll get notifications as to when my next video does come out. Admittedly, creating videos is not something that I do full time, so it may take a while for my next video to come out. So make sure you do subscribe so that you do get the notification as to when it does come out. So until next time, goodbye.